Hello and welcome back to CS631 Advanced Programming in the Unix Environment. After our introduction to IPC concepts in our last video, we'll begin looking at the various methods in detail with this segment. Here we'll talk about so-called System 5 IPC. Not surprisingly, System 5 IPC is called System 5 IPC because these three types of inter-process communication mechanisms were first introduced in AT&T Unix System 5 in the early 80s while BSD focused on the sockets API. The three mechanisms then introduced, and which we will cover in this video, are semaphores, shared memory, and message queues. All three of these mechanisms are nowadays supported by most Unix systems, and we'll even see how at least the concept of message queues has since been translated to cross-network systems, and is even offered as a service by certain giant cloud computing providers. Although, of course, those services are built on top of the Sockets API we'll cover in a future video. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. System 5 IPC mechanisms use specific IPC kernel structures, utilizing an identifier and a key to reference these in-kernel resources. And as a result, they are obviously and necessarily restricted to communications between processes on the same system. However, and this is perhaps a bit surprising, since normally we consider IPC to be primarily synchronous and ephemeral in nature, these resources are persistent, meaning the structures will remain present even after a process that created or accessed them has terminated. We'll see what this looks like by example in a little bit. Finally, since these structures only exist in kernel space and are not usually manifested in the file system, we can't use our usual file descriptor API to access them and instead require both special system calls as well as command line tools to access and manipulate them. So let's start our deep dive into System 5 IPC and begin with semaphores. A semaphore is really more of a locking or coordination mechanism to access a critical region. And you should be familiar with them from your operating systems class when you talked about concurrency and perhaps discussed the dining philosopher's problem. In the System 5 implementation, a semaphore then is a simple counter that the kernel provides certain atomic functions and guarantees on. In order for you to access a shared resource, to pick up your second chopstick after you've been thinking for a while, for example, you test the semaphore that controls the resource and check if the counter is greater than zero. If so, you decrement the counter, use the resource, that is, you pick up the second chopstick and eat your noodles, and then decrement the counter when you've put down the chopstick. If the value of the semaphore is zero, then you go back to thinking, or your process goes to sleep. Now this sequence of operation, testing, incrementing, decrementing, or blocking until it has a certain value, are all done at atomically, which of course is the point of the semaphore. The functions you use for this are semget, semcontrol, and semop. Let's look at an example. Here's our semdemo program. We begin by creating a key to identify the semaphore with. For that, we call the ftalk library function. This function uses a path name and an identifier to construct an IPC identifier suitable for use with the System 5 IPC syscalls. It does this by combining the inode and device ID of the given path name with the ID passed in, thereby allowing for a reproducible identifier that doesn't require you to hardcode the key. Next, we call initsem to initialize the semaphore, using a custom function that handles a few of the edge cases around this. The comments in the code hopefully are sufficient for you to follow along on your own. Next, we ask the user to request a lock, after which we call semop. This call performs a test of the semaphore with subsequent decrement and will block until it can get a hold of the semaphore. After that, the user can unlock again. To avoid deadlocks, the kernel will release a lock when the process terminates, but just as we are good citizens and close our file descriptors, we also unlock any semaphores when we are done. So when we run this, and hit return, we will immediately get the semaphore, since no other process currently tries to grab it. Now before we unlock, let's start a second process that will try to gain a hold on the lock. 
This process will now block, as the semaphore is currently held by the first process. In the second, we unlock that process, our second process gains the lock and can now enter its critical section. Likewise, running the program again here on the left shows that this process is now blocked until the second process releases its lock. We noted earlier that the system 5 IPC structures are persistent, so the kernel has created the semaphore based on our key, and we should be able to inspect it by running the IPCS command. Here, we note that the semaphore set has permissions and ownerships associated with it, just like a file, thereby allowing access control to the users, if so desired. So let's illustrate this by becoming another user, Fred. Note that Fred can run the program and gain a hold in the semaphore because the permissions on the semaphore set are as shown on the left and our two processes competing for the log behave just the same as before. The semaphore sets allocated by the kernel are thus visible to all users, but a user who is not the owner of a semaphore set cannot remove it. Fred can see the semaphore set just as the owner can see the permissions, but Fred cannot remove the semaphore set by the identifier. The owner, however, can. Okay. So let's consider how data flows in normal IPC. Here we have a simple shell pipeline, where one process reads data from a file, pipes it to another process, which then writes the data to another file. In the process, our data will need to cross the boundary between kernel and user space multiple times. When we call cat input, the process has to fetch the data from the disk, which means crossing the user land and kernel space boundary but the IPC itself happens in the kernel space too. That is, after shoveling all the data from kernel space into user land, it then needs to transfer it back into kernel space, and then back into user space on the receiving end where our second cat command will then write the data to disk again, once more crossing from user space into kernel space. So we're crossing this user space kernel space boundary four times, and doing so is generally quite expensive. Perhaps we can come, come up with a more efficient way? Enter shared memory. In this model, we have both processes access a certain area in memory, which means that we can cut down on the number of times that the data has to cross from user space into kernel space. With this improvement in mind, it shouldn't come as a surprise that shared memory then presents the fastest form of inter-process communications. Since we are sharing a region of memory, it may make sense to protect access to this region to avoid two processes overriding each other's data. And what better way to do that than using a semaphore? Note though that this really isn't necessary if you have strictly sequential access via some other sort of agreed access. But for possibly concurrent writes, you do need some sort of locking mechanism, and semaphores lend themselves well for this. Okay, so to obtain a shared memory segment, you call shimget, then use shimat to attach the segment to your process address space, shimdt to detach again, and shimcontrol for any of the other operations. Let's take a look at a practical example once more. As with our SEM demo example, we begin by determining a suitable identifier using ftalk, then get a new shared memory segment creating it if it doesn't exist, much like we'd create a new file we call open with ocreate. We attach the memory segment and then either read or write data from or to this area in memory. 
And just like always, we clean up before we exit, this time by detaching the memory segment. When we run the program, we first write some data into the shared memory segment. Note that now our process terminates, but of course the data remains stored in the memory segment. And IPCS-M can show us the information about this memory segment. In particular, we can inspect the permissions and ownership just like for semaphores. We note that we see information about which process ID created the segment, as well as which last accessed it. And we have timestamps for the last time of segment attachment, detachment, and last change via shim control. If we run the command again, without any arguments, it will simply retrieve the data from the memory segment. But note that the data remains persistent, so a second invocation will again display the same results. That is, the shared memory really works just like a regular file, and the timestamps for the attach and detach time are a way to determine last access. Also note that just be as before, we can allow other users access to the data. So Fred can certainly retrieve the information from the shared segment. But Fred can also write data into the segment, because we created it with write permissions granted to other users. The output field shows the process ID of the process that last accessed the shared memory segment. Just like with semaphores, since the segment remains persistent, it is the responsibility of the user to remove any unused mappings. And if you were to try to read data from the segment with no data, you simply get no data back, since our program created a brand new segment, using the same key as before, but now yielding a new identifier. Since we are talking about data being stored in memory, we should be able to observe the address of the memory segment. So if we update our memory layout program from week 6, we can observe that the shared memory segment space appears to be somewhere below the stack and above the heap. What the size limitations are on shared memory and what happens when you try to exhaust them is an exercise I'll leave for you to complete on your own time. For now, let's move on to message queues. So what are message queues? As the name suggests, they are linked lists of messages. More specifically, the list is a FIFO, that is, they are ordered and can be consumed only in the specified order. As the other forms of System 5 IPC we discuss in this video, they also are stored in kernel space, following some of the same semantics as we'll see in a moment. You create a new message queue via message get, you add new messages to the end of the queue via message send, and consume them via message receive, with additional properties being controlled via message control. What exactly is a message, though? Well, that's really kind of up to the user. You can define a structure for your messages yourself. The only stipulation is that the first element must be a long, defining the message type, which helps to find the delivery of the message. See the manual page for more details. In our example, we'll use a very simple struct to only relay a few bytes of text. So, for our example, we'll need two programs, one to send the message and one to receive the message. We define our message to be a simple text message, then ask the user to provide the key identifier rather than to use ftalk as we did before. This is merely to illustrate that we can use any integer as an identifier and allow the user in this way to specify different message queues on the command line. The creation of the message queue follows pretty much the same semantics of the other System 5 IPC examples, and we then craft our message to deliver and then submit it into the queue in a non-blocking way. We compile it and then take a look at the receiving program. The receiver really doesn't look very different, and all we do here is pick up a message from the queue, print the text, and exit. 
So let's create a new queue and submit a message. Let's say hello. IPCS queue shows us all the details, much as we're used to by now. For message queues, this includes the number of bytes in the queue, the number of messages, which process ID last accessed it, which last read from it, and when the queue was created, data submitted, and data last read from. Since it is an asynchronous queue, we can send multiple messages without overriding previous data, as was the case in the shared memory example. And we can observe the queue stats reflect this. When we run our receive program, it will pick off the first message in the queue. Hello in this case. And IPCS queue shows the updated information. Now, as before, we also allow multiple user access to this queue. So let's ask Fred to do that. Fred runs receive and gets the next message in the queue, which works because the queue was created with read permissions for others. So now our queue is drained. And when we try to run receive, the call will block as no messages are present. Let's see if Fred can unblock us here. Ah, but unfortunately, Fred can't save us. Fred doesn't have permissions to write to the queue, only to read. So let's have Fred read. Now, we have two processes reading from the queue. Let's create another shell from where we can send a message into the queue. Which of the two processes currently being blocked will receive this message? Fred or our other process? Well, Fred is still blocked, but the other process is now unblocked. This shows that consumers of the queue are still waiting in order, even while blocked. We can now unblock poor Fred by sending a new message into the queue. There. Our queue is now empty again. What happens if we try to read from a different queue? Not surprisingly, that won't block. It'll simply fail, since a queue with that key doesn't exist. Cleanup of our IPC resources is again the same as before. So as you've seen here, message queues look indeed quite nifty. Remember, they are initially created to help overcome limitations in the only other IPC mechanisms available at the time, half-duplex pipes, which we will cover in our next video. In modern systems, however, Unix pipes and the socket API closed the performance gap. But if you wanted to implement real-time applications, you needed a few additional features, including a way to express priority of messages. And so POSIX message queues were born, similar in syntax and semantics to System 5 message queues, but now standardized and providing a few additional features. For starters, we no longer need to use ftalk or similar keys, as we can now identify message queues by name. These named message queues may now be exposed in the file system, which can come in handy. We allow both blocking and non-blocking communications, and we allow for a way to skip the queue and place a message to the head by assigning a higher priority. And finally, we add a way for your process to be notified of incoming messages rather than sitting there and waiting. This is particularly useful and perhaps best illustrated by another example. Okay, so here we have our POSIX message queue sender example. Instead of a key, we'll specify a name, which follows the semantics of path names, even though it may not necessarily be represented in the file system. We open the message queue for writing, then send all the messages we are given with the same default priority. After that, though, we also add a message of a higher priority, which should be queued after the other messages, but which then may be received by the other process before the others. Then we close the queue and exit. 
The receiver program looks like this. In main, we register signal handler to set a flag that new messages have arrived. We open the message queue and then configure it to send us a signal whenever new messages arrive in an empty queue by calling mqnotify. We pause and whenever a signal is received, we empty the message queue, iterating over all messages in the queue and printing them. When we compile our sender and receiver, we have to link them against the real-time library, as this is the library that provides the POSIX message queue interface. This looks like so. Dash LRT. Okay, the receiver with no messages present in the queue will block as we are now pausing, waiting for messages to arrive. If we now send a few messages, we'll observe that our receiver wakes up after having been notified, but even though our messages were delivered in order, the receiver will see the higher priority message sent last as the first message to pick off the queue. If we wait for a second in between message submissions, we see our receiver picking them off one by one as they arrive as it is receiving a new signal for each incoming message. If we run the command again, we may observe notification of the incoming messages to happen fast enough for the receiver to process them, such that the higher priority message only comes in last. If you run the receiver with a wait flag, it would allow for all messages to come in before then picking them off, again showing the higher priority message as the first message if the queue has not been drained beforehand. Okay, we went through System 5 IBC quite quickly, so let's recap here. All forms of IBC we've seen here were asynchronous and only possible for processes on the same system. System 5 IPC is amongst the oldest forms of IPC, but by no means obsolete. The use of semaphores is primarily intended for guarding critical sections and coordinating access to shared resources. And shared memory allows for very fast IPC. Message queues, while perhaps not all that often seen in the System 5 incarnation, have, as a concept, become quite popular in the last 10 or so years as they implement the common pop-sub model for producers and consumers to exchange messages. Built on top of other forms of IPC, which we'll see in future videos, they can be found offered as services from various providers and implemented in different software stacks, both open source and proprietary, so are definitely a useful technology to understand. With that, let's break here. In the next video, we'll discuss the other, oldest, and still most ubiquitous form of IPC, the Unix pipe. Until then, thanks for watching. Cheers!